Um, good evening and welcome to our meeting of Citizens for Informed Land Use, um, or CELU, as we like to call ourselves for short. Uh, we are coming this evening to a meeting with uh, Tom Matulowicz, who is a master gardener and master composter. So we're going to be learning a lot about how to have healthy gardens through composting. Um, we're very fortunate to have his expertise here. We're very fortunate that you're willing to come and share your expertise with us. So thank you very much. Um, this presentation is being recorded for those who are not here and they will, it will be available on our CELU YouTube channel. I'm Karen Strickland and with me is Regina Cristioni. We are the co-presidents of CELU. Thank you all for joining us this evening. CELU is a community organization founded in 1998 to preserve Homedale farmland and other open spaces and to protect the natural resources of our town, particularly our Swimming River Reservoir and Watershed, the source of drinking water for residents of Monmouth County and surrounding counties. Our mission is also to give citizens the information they need so that they can advocate for good government to ensure we are effective at protecting the land that we love. CELU follows issues to identify what effects they will have on the quality of life in Homedale. For example, we are currently following the project at Potter's Farm to identify its effects on the flooding and the Waikik watershed um, area. Uh, we're following the Charter Study Commission to identify what effects it will have on good government. And we are watching carefully the town's plans for stormwater management as flooding is becoming a more persistent problem in our town. On a more positive note, recently we supported a scout who built a kiosk at the Harding House at Bayonet Farm. Please go over there and take a look and walk the trails. Right now the township is working at upgrading the trails to take care of the erosion that's there. So go walk and enjoy. And later this evening, Regina will tell you how you can find the secret area to admire daffodils that Laura Harding planted at the Harding House, at the Bayonet Farm in the woods. So this evening, we are fortunate to have with us Tom Matulowicz. He's a 1999 graduate of the first Master Gardener class given in Monmouth County. Since then, he has achieved the title of Master Composter, Rain Garden Specialist, and Rain Garden Specialist Trainer, and Rain Barrel Workshop Instructor. So a lot of experience and expertise. Tom has given many talks on composting, rain gardens, and rain barrel workshops throughout New Jersey. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Tom graduated from Rutgers University with a BA in labor studies. So he's moved a ways from that and also in credits towards an MBA from Monmouth University. Uh, Tom and his wife, Susan, fell in love with Rumson during a Sunday drive. They discovered an old house about 1865. You can maybe give us some advice on the Harding house that was for sale and decided it was perfect for them. And so they lovingly restored it to its original condition and along with the surrounding gardens. And I like this detail. They have a small greenhouse where Susan raises and cares for a whole collection of all kinds of orchids. Um, so a really wonderful gardening kind of family. Um, all right, so uh, Tom is gonna speak to us first. Keep all your questions. And then you may post in the question part of your screen for afterwards, after the presentation, he will answer the questions for us. Um, Tom? It's well, thank, you. thank you, Karen. Thanks for the introduction. And thank you uh, for CELU for inviting me to this uh, affair this evening. Uh, I, I know folks that we all have a lot to do tonight, you know, especially eating. I love to eat my, you know, I love to eat. And uh, so I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. We'll hold the questions to the end and, um, and we'll try to do this in less than an hour or less. So here we go. We're going to start off, I hope. Let's see, already we have a problem. Okay, we'll do this. Composting. Why should we talk about composting? We're going to reduce waste. What kind of waste are we going to reduce? We're going to reduce the food waste that. Uh oh. Uh, Tom, wait a minute. We lost your video for a sec. Oh, your audio. Can you start over? Why? Uh, move closer to your machine. Why should we compost? Is that better? Yes. Stay right there. 
<laughs> uh, we want to reduce waste. Now, what kind of waste are we talking about? We're talking about the food waste that comes out of our kitchen every single day. And we also want to create a resource. So what is the resource we would like to create? We're going to create compost. It's a beautiful thing. And that's going to come from our food waste. Now, how many people in the audience recycle? I, I give this talk to live audiences and all the hands go up, right? Everybody recycles. Now, why does everybody recycle? Well, the bottom line is it's a New Jersey state law. You have to recycle glass, metal, cans, paper, cardboard. So all of that material has to be recycled. And, uh, but there's no, and then I asked the question, how many people are composting? Because composting is recycling and hardly anybody raises their hand because very few people are composting. Yet we are recycling food waste. And what I like to say is we're trying to save this planet one banana peel at a time. And we can do it. Because when you recycle and you put your stuff out at the curb, you don't really know where any of that stuff is going, do you? I mean, it goes to a reclamation center, but you don't know if it's really being recycled, or what they're doing with it, or are they just dumping it? Uh, Sometimes people separate out at the curb and then a, one truck comes by and they throw it all in one truck. So uh, you know, we don't know what's happening to it. If you recycle your food waste, you know exactly where it's going to go. It's going to go into your recycle, your compost unit. Now, does everybody know where your trash goes? In Monmouth County, the Reclamation Center is in Tinton Falls. Shafto Road near Asbury Avenue. It's kind of hidden. Uh, they have a lot of trees growing around, tall trees. But if you go by there, sometimes you can smell it. You know it's there. And there are people now that are buying homes, you know, very close to this center, this reclamation center. And uh, now they're complaining about the smell and they're suing the uh, reclamation center. And when they sue the reclamation center, guess who they're suing? They're suing all of us because we're all owners of this county reclamation center. So, you know, so it's kind of goofy, but that's what's happening out there. Now, the center is approximately 300 acres for this landfill. 200 of the acres have already been filled. They're working on the last 100 acres in the landfill. Now, what's going to happen once that last 100 acres are filled? Where is your trash going to go? This is like a well-kept secret. Uh, I haven't heard anybody talking about it except for me when I give my compost talks. Uh, the county may be is talking about it amongst themselves, but nothing in the public of once this landfill reaches full capacity, which is not that far off, where is the trash going to go? Is it going to be incinerated? Where is the incinerator going to go? Is it going to be shipped out of town, put on a boat, put on a train? Who's going to pay for that? Well, we're all going to pay more in taxes to get rid of the trash. So instead of keep it in Monmouth County, because we'll never find another location in Monmouth County to have a 300 acre landfill. So that's going to be a, a question that's going to come up somewhere along the way in the, in the very near future. This is what it looks like. This is another view. It looks like a pyramid. It's almost 300 feet high. If you want to get a visual, anybody ever go to Mount Mitchell in the Highlands? It's the highest point on the... Uh, Eastern Seaboard, <laughs> highest point on the Eastern Seaboard at 275 feet. So if you stood there at Mount Mitchell, you can get a very good idea of this thing at 300 feet. And it's looking like a pyramid, and I'll show you why it looks that way. Uh, the landfill, here's some stats on it, 1,200 tons of waste per day, per day, 400,000 tons per year. 26% is organic waste. It's more than that. It's, it's over 30%. And it's, 
well, it's just thrown on the floor. They call this the tipping floor. So you see a garbage truck, typical garbage truck. They back into this. This is day in and day out, 24 hours a day. They back in, open up the back of the truck, throw it out onto the floor. There's another big bulldozer in this big shed, the tipping floor, pushes this into another truck that's brought up to the landfill and dumps this, this trash up on, on top of the landfill. And this goes on day after day, day after day, trucks coming and going. And that's why that landfill is gonna fill up very quickly. Why does it look like a pyramid? Well, you can see what they're doing here. This is a picture of a, uh, what they're doing is bailing the trash. So if you ever saw a picture of a car going into a, uh, um, a, a salvage yard, you'll see it being crushed in the machinery they have there into a, a block of steel, about the same size that you're looking at right now. Then they take these blocks of steel and bring them up to the, the uh, top of the unit and just cover it with sand and, and dirt. And that's why you get that pyramid look out there. And then once that landfill reaches full capacity, they plant grass seed on it and you'll never know that it's there. I guess if you, you'll know it's there, but it'll be covered in grass. And uh, this is kind of unique. Uh, that landfill gives off methane gas. That's the, when you go by there, that's what you smell when you drive by. The county, the reclamation center is capturing some of that methane gas and using it. This is an electric generating station that you see before you. Uh, they're using the methane gas as fuel to generate electricity, which, je which operates the bailing unit. So it's kind of a recirculating of uh, some of the waste uh, methane gas that's burned off into the air that we smell. Uh, th this is a study that was done by some college students about uh, a landfill. It was a landfill for about 10 years. They went in there, the students went into this landfill and they dug around and then they pulled out some items, these three items, after 10 years in a landfill. And your upper left, that green material, if anybody can guess what that is, picture one, the upper left is grass. You can still see it 10 years in a landfill, never, then it still looks like grass. To your right, upper right, you see something with an orange around it, or a black or with orange. And that's a carrot. It looks like a carrot. If you scrape, scrape off that black material, you probably eat that carrot. But the, why isn't it breaking down? And there in the picture in the bottom left, it's newspaper. You can still read the print on the newspaper. So why isn't any of that material not breaking down? Because it's so tightly condensed that the microbes can't live in there. The microbes need air, microbes need water. That's what breaks down that material. And it's not getting that because it's like I showed in the, the previous uh, pictures, it's so tightly packed that water and air cannot get in there to uh, knock this thing down and degrade it. So it's always going to be there. So uh, for the benefits of composting, improved surf, uh, uh, soil of the uh, uh, health, make minerals readily available, and water holding capacity for the soil and reducing soil erosion. Now in, in Monmouth County, we have uh, sort of a, we have clay soil, we have a sandy soil, we have some good soil. But for those plants or people that have a clay soil, compost works great because it helps to uh, dissipate the water, holds the water for a little bit and lets it go. With a clay soil, the water just sort of stays in there and, and your plants get wet feet and can't grow well. And, and people with sandy soil, the, it's just the reverse. They put the compost in there and it holds the water against the uh, roots of the plant. So it doesn't uh, dissipate, the water doesn't dissipate that quickly. Um, and as far as the health of the soil, we can't say it's a fertilizer because to call it a fertilizer, we have to know what the ingredients are. We do not know what the ingredients are of compost. Everybody's compost is gonna be a little bit different. When you go to a store and buy a, a fertilizer, everything is marked exactly the 
amount of uh, ingredients in that uh, bag that you purchase. But with compost, we really can't tell. All we know is that it is great for the soil. You can send it out to the, we have a, in Rutgers, we have a lab that will uh, test the plant and get exactly what's in your compost, but it costs like $20 to have that done. So it's really not worth, we know compost is good for, for plants and the soil. Now here's a typical three types of soil. The one in the middle is soil just basically below the, uh, the earth line. And your, your top soil is probably only a few inches deep. And then after that, there's nothing. It's just sterile soil. And that reddish color comes from the makeup of the soil in the area, like Red Bank, New Jersey is pretty much called Red Bank because of this Red Bank soil that, that's there and pretty much throughout Monmouth County. So if we look to the... Uh, So that's the, that with no amendments in it. Now, if you look to your right, that soil with leaf mulch mixed in, you can see how much browner and richer it's looking. And if you look to your left, that's with compost and leaf vegetation built into it. And it's just a beautiful soil that'll make plants grow, plants love it. Now, do's for you, what can you put in a compost pile? You can put in, all the things you see here, banana peels, citrus fruits, corn cobs, coffee grinds, all of this stuff, eggshells are great. All of this can go in. Everything has to go in though with uh, a balance. So you say, well, I can get all the coffee grinds I want. Well, that's not good. If you just put coffee grinds in there, it's not gonna break down. So everything has to be in balance. And so if you do a little bit of uh, each and every one of these things, and you'll find most of this stuff will come out of your kitchen, a lot of this stuff. And uh, that, that's what you're gonna use to make your compost. And that's things now that you're just throwing away. Uh, straw, hair, leaves, manure. Now you can't put in manure from a meat eating animal like your dog, your pet dog, or your pet cat. Uh, that's not good. But if you have chickens, if you have uh, cows, you have horses, all of that, uh, they're not meat eaters. You can put their manure into uh, your compost pile. Sawdust, wood, uh, seaweed, tea bags. You can put a tea bag in with the string, with the staple, with the tag. It's all going to disappear into the compost. You'll never know it was there. Now, what we do not want to put in dairy products or meat, no meat bones, pet waste, nothing like that. And why not? We're going to maybe attract animals to the uh, compost unit and that we do not want to do. So uh, keep all of those items out of your compost unit. Now, this is kind of a nice trick when I give a uh, talk to uh, youngsters. So you build three bins, build a rabbit cage on top, insert the rabbit, rabbit drops its manure and bombs away into the compost unit on the bottom. So you're getting your manure going in with the rest of the material that's already in bins. Build it and they'll come. What do I mean by that? Once you start composting, you're going to get all kinds of bacteria, fungi, all kinds of critters that are gonna come in, no harm to you, but they, they're gonna just eat away with the microbes and just, it, it's amazing. You keep putting things into your compost unit and they just completely disappear. It's like a magic trick. It's all because of these consumers and there's all kinds of various, various types that, that go in there and start to, and they just appear. Again, like magic. So the five essential, this is a test question, five essentials of composting, Volume, water, carbons, nitrogens, aeration. Volume, ideal size for backyard composting, what is that's what we're talking about today, is about three feet by three feet by three feet. So that's exactly what we would like to get uh, compost. If it's bigger than that, it's too cool. If it's smaller than that, you're not gonna get enough out to make it worthwhile. So three feet by three feet by three feet is ideal. 
water, you want to keep this thing by like a uh, damp sponge. Okay. If uh, if you grab a handful of your compost and you you squeeze it in your hand and water comes out of it, it's too wet. And if it falls apart, it may be too dry. So if it feels like a wet sponge, damp sponge, that's perfect. Then we have the carbons, which is the uh, dead material, like shredded leaves and uh, all kinds of old plants and things that you're coming from your garden. And the nitrogens are, are what's coming out of your kitchen. So that's all of the things that we looked at a little bit earlier that can go in as your green material. Now you're gonna need more brown material than you're gonna have green material. And then we'll talk about the recipe, if you will, in a moment. And aeration we talked about, very important. So the five essentials, volume, water, carbons, nitrogens, aeration, five essentials. Just remember that and you'll be successful. And the other thing you wanna do is the surface area of the material you put in. Now, if you put in a banana peel and banana peel has a fleshy soil, uh, skin, that's gonna break down right away. Uh, if you put a, a, a broccoli stem, for example, it's hard. And so what I do is I cut my broccoli stem up into smaller pieces and I throw that in. So the smaller you make the pieces going into your compost unit, the quicker it's going to break down and give you the beautiful compost that you're looking for. And it's also a good way to relieve stress. See, if you have your pumpkins in the fall, you can do the same thing, break them up, or your watermelons in the summertime, you make, just break them up, put it in a small piece, and you'd be, you'd be shocked. You put it in there, and a couple of weeks later, they're all gone. Beginning the compost. All right, we determine the materials we have available to compost. So we know we have kitchen waste, uh, we have dried leaves. We have leaves in the fall. We can use that. We need the location of the compost unit and what kind of system do we use? So we have leaves, the grass we can use, plant and garden trimmings, and food scraps. We have all of this material available to us. Uh, the unit you see in the back here, the black uh, looks like a garbage can. The county is selling that unit. It's called the Earth Machine. Uh, that machine, if you look it up online, and I uh, ask you all to do that, just look it up online, called Earth Machine Compost Unit. It's about $100, some places even more. The county, Monmouth County, is selling this unit for $35. $35 for this unit that you would pay $100 for. Now, why is the county, Monmouth County, selling this unit for $35? They want more and more people to compost to keep that material out of the landfill, to keep that landfill going for a longer period of time. So uh, that's why they have it and they're selling them. Uh, I will give the information at the end and anybody that's interested, you can, uh, uh, we'll get them to you somehow, some way. But yes, for $35, that's the best bargain ever. All right, uh, now the location should be convenient. You don't want it too far away from the kitchen. You don't want to walk. If you have a big piece of property, you don't want to put way back in the back of the property. So you have to long distance walk to get your uh, food waste into the compost. You know, so you want it somewhat close, uh, close to a water supply. Not absolutely necessary because I, what I do at home is I, uh, take my pail, I empty it, my little uh, compost pail. I'll go into a little more detail on this. And then when it's empty, I put water into it. And then I uh, put my food scraps in. Then I take that whole bucket out and pour it in. And now I'm adding my water and I'm adding my uh, uh, nitrogen. So I don't have to be close to a water supply. Uh, choice of materials. We have lots of materials that we can use. Does it okay in the shade or sun? Doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt anything and avoid placing over aggressive roots. What they're saying there is because this soil is so healthy, the root systems like to go to it. But I've, I've had mine for 20 years and I've never had a problem with the roots. There's all different types, open pile. This is people that were a big piece of property, wanna just dump it somewhere and keep covering it up. But it's hard to get the compost out of it. It's hard to work with. 
uh, spread out so it doesn't break down quickly. So I would say, uh, let's stay away from that. Uh, bin snow fence. These are for people that want to build one themselves. If you have old snow fence hanging around, you can use that. Uh, pallets, people give pallets away. Pallets make an ideal uh, compost unit if you want to build one. And sometimes you get the pallets for free. People will say, just take them. So that, that's a possibility. Wire, you can use wire, uh, chicken wire, something else, make a circle around three feet uh, around, and uh, that might work for you. Uh, three section wood bins are good at community gardens. So uh, for home, I would just recommend that uh, earth machine that I mentioned earlier. And the tumblers, I am not happy with tumblers. Uh, once you get something in there, they're hard to flip around. Uh, rollers are the same way. They're, once you get material in there, you can't get the material out. It's difficult to get the material out and they're difficult to roll. And this is probably the best of the bunch of the hand crank roller type. Uh, you can put your wheelbarrow underneath. There's a door, you can see the door there on there, a green uh, barrel. Uh, and there's a crank on the uh, right-hand side of that. The only problem with the thing is it costs about $500 for that unit, where the county is selling something for $35. So there's a choice of a, a crank unit for $500 or $35 for the earth machine. And that's the earth machine again. Uh, it's sturdy. I've had mine over 20 years, and it's still uh, still in great shape. It really is, and it, it's. You're not going to have a problem with that. They're really, really solidly made. And then they have this handy compost that the county was selling this years ago, but they decided not to sell those any longer. So that's not available any longer. And no special tools are needed. Maybe just a shovel, pitchfork, and that's about it. There's really nothing to, uh, to, uh, no, no exact uh, tool that you need for composting. There is one tool that I recommend though, and it's called a wing dig, W-I-N-G dig, D-I-G. If you look that up online, it's about a $15 unit. It makes life so easy. And it's nothing more than a metal rod, with a little handle on the end with a little arrow on the other end. And you just push it in and out of your compost unit and it aerates and it's very easy to use and it holds up well. So for $15, I, I would recommend uh, the wing dig. I have no stock in the company, just something that works for me and others I recommend it and they love it. Now ingredients for the cop. Now here's your uh, formula that you need. You need more brown material than you do the green material. So for the carbons, the brown material, basically two parts to one part of nitrogen. So if I bring out my little pail to my compost unit, that's all nitrogen, and I put that into my compost unit, right next to my compost unit, I, I have shredded leaves. So I pick up two big handfuls, that's my two parts of brown material, and I just sprinkle that right up over the top of what I just put in. So that's my two parts to one. Now, it may be for somebody else, it may be one part to one part. Uh, somebody else may need three parts to one part. Everybody is going to be a little bit different. You'll get used to it. You'll get it after a bit. If you have too much carbon, it's going to slow the process. It'll be too dry. And if you put too much uh, nitrogen in there, not enough brown material, it's going to become anaerobic. It'll be too wet, anaerobic. The uh, microbes won't be able to work and make their magic, and then it's going to smell. If you're doing this correctly, the composting, you should get no odor at all out of your unit. And then we're going to do a lasagna effect. So when you're bringing your material from the kitchen, you put that into your compost unit, and then you put your brown material right on top of that. Then the next day or the next time you come out with your, your material from the kitchen, you pour that in, then you put more brown material on, and you just keep that lasagna effect going. Just layer, layer, layer. Always put the brown material on last. Now, this way, it'll keep down any uh, flies that may be there or uh, anything else that may uh, be there. So, uh, yeah, so keep, just keep the brown material on top and do that laser uh, 
lasagna effect. And finished compost, when you get it, you're gonna love it. Uh, those that are now composting, just we can't say enough about it. It's just a great material and it's free. You don't have to run out and buy bags of fertilizer and everything else. So uh, what can you use compost for? Planting uh, new plants, you can use it. You can use it for mulch around existing plants. To soil amendment, we mentioned that. If you have clay soil, it's good for clay soil. If you have sandy soil, it's good for sandy soil. So it's like a, a perfect uh, ingredient. Compost use it, you can start seedlings with it. You can make compost tea. And what I mean by compost tea, you take an old uh, bag, old pantyhose or old, one of those bags that onions come in and potatoes come in sometimes and fill, put compost into that bag and leave it in a bucket of like a five gallon bucket of water for uh, overnight or you know, for a period of time, just like a tea bag. And then uh, use that water for uh, watering your plants. So it works well. And then the compost has now lost all its ingredients to the water, but you can still use that as a mulch and still spread it around your plants. Uh, alternative for grass, uh, what we're trying to do here is cut it and leave it, plant more flowers. I took a walk the other day, you know, our garden, we get a lot of uh, plants already coming up, crocuses and snowdrops and uh, a, lot of, a lot of flowers on, you know, on a property. And then I walked for about an hour through the rest of my area and I hardly saw any flowers at all. I saw beautiful green grass, but you know, for pollinators, for the butterflies, where do they go? What do they do? Where, where are they gonna get their nutrients from? So plant more you know, trees, plant shrubs, plants, more flowers. Let's help the uh, wildlife. Oh, uh, here's what I do at home. This is my, uh, my home here. I have a... Uh, Lawn mower, I put the bag on the back when I shred the leaves. In the fall, we let everything hit the ground. We don't touch anything. We just leave it there all winter long. In the spring, so this is spring cleanup for us. Now we start pulling in the leaves. I grind them with the lawn mower, and then I put them all into big black uh, construction bags. So if you have, maybe if you have a lawn service, you can ask those folks to, you can give them the bags and maybe they'll shred leaves for you and put that, that in a bag and that's your brown material. And that may last, I, I do enough to last me all you know, the whole summer because I make com compost all summer long. So that's what I do at home. I use mostly shredded leaves and they work great, but they have to be shredded. An oak leaf, if you don't shred it, it looks like an oak leaf. They're like a piece of leather. They're really hard to break down. But if you shred it, it will break down very quickly. And here's a pile uh, before it goes into a bag. Now I just put it directly into the bags. Here's my kitchen. You'll see that pot on the, with the stove, the white stove there. There's a pot, a chrome pot there to the left. That's my uh, compost pot. Now, when that pot is empty after I uh, unload it at the compost unit, I put about one third water in that pot. And then I, when I, after I put my, uh, food waste into the pot and bring it out to the, to the compost units, I'm using my water. So that's my, one of my five elements. So the water's already in my bucket and everything washes out nice and clean. If I didn't have water in there, it would be sticking to the pot. It'd be a mess trying to clean it. If you put the water in first and the material in after, it washes out very quickly in a quick wipe and it's nice and clean. So that's what we do at home. And my compost unit is behind the fence. This is kind of messy, but it works. And in the winter time, what are you gonna do if you get snowed in? And what are you gonna do with your compost if you have an active composter? Well, if you had a situation like you see with here, uh, just have a five gallon bucket. You can put that material in there with a cover on it. And when the, when you, the freeze is finished, the snow is gone, then you can go back out to your composting units. Uh, so that's what uh, you have to be prepared for. So that is my presentation. I thank all of you for listening to me. And I, I thank the, the crew over there at uh, the Citizens for Land Use. They're doing a great job over there. And uh, thank you so much. Any questions? Um, if you have, if people have questions, 
um, if people have questions, they should put them into the chat. I got to say, this was one of the most practical composting presentations I've ever seen. <laughs> because I've always wanted to try to do it, but it just seems too complicated or too expensive and I couldn't figure it out. But now shredding the leaves, right? So how does how do you, do you rake them up and then run the lawnmower back and forth over the top of them? Or how do you shred those leaves with a lawnmower? Okay, good question. So I rake them into a pile. And then that lawnmower that I showed you, I just work it right around as a circle. I just circle around that big pile until the bag is filled. I put the bag and you know, empty it out and then continue from there. So it's, it's easy enough to do, yes. That is uh, really impressive. I'm, I'm just so impressed. Okay, so, uh, okay, so Bill Little said, you said just leave your leaves on the lawn. Let me just see this chat thing, okay. Uh, um, oh. Leaving your leaves on the lawn over the winter, doesn't that kill the grass? Uh, actually, what happens in the forest, you know, it, they break down, uh, the grass will be there. It's not going to hurt the grass. If you leave the leaves there, the leaves will probably blow off anyway on their own. Um, so they don't need the, the help of a blower and making all kinds of noise in the area and blowing dust and dirt all over. So that's what we do. We leave it. And then in the uh, springtime is when our cleanup takes place. So now do you have the kind of lawn, though, that people walk by and go, oh, he doesn't have a nice lawn or? <laughs> Mostly flowers. <laughs> okay. The, the lawn there is pathways. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I like the look of a lawn, but you know, put some flowers out there, too. You know, get some flowers out there. Yeah, but you know what happens? You put flowers out there, and the deer. I I bought some flowers, and wow. uh, the guy at the de at the store said, "Oh, well, you're just providing a buffet for the deer." Yeah. Well, there are plants. If you go to uh, Rutgers, um, they have a um, fact sheets. You have deer resistant plants. So if you just go to Rutgers .ed fact sheets, ask for deer resistant plants, and they have a whole list of plants that you can put in that uh, deer do not like. Yeah. Unless it's really a bad winter and then they'll eat anything. Yeah, basically. everything. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, other questions here. Um, okay. Um, is there a difference in the acidity of leaves versus pine needles that you have to be aware of when composting? Yes. Yeah. And that, that's a good question. And you can do a soil test. Um, if you bring your, your soil to RCE out of the Kalowski Road, for ten dollars, I don't know if it's ten or twelve dollars. Uh, they give you a bag. You uh, put your soil in there, and they'll test the soil to see how acid it is or neutralized, and uh, with recommendations. So uh, that's one way to go. Or you can buy a test kit to test your soil, because your soil may be different in different locations. So, uh, but yeah, pine needles will be a little bit more acidic than uh, leaves would be. So it depends on what's sitting there and. And where, on. where again do they have to take it for the test? Uh, the, uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Just okay. go to Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Kalowski Road in Freehold. Excellent. Okay. Um, so if you're trying to grow an organic garden, but some of the vegetables you are composting are not organic, do the chemicals dissipate when you compost or do they stay in the compost? Yeah, the, uh, for the amount of uh, material that's in there that's left, I don't think that's going to cause any problem at all. For the organic grower, it doesn't. So you, so it's okay to put compost. Um, yeah, the compost that you're making, you know, the heat of the compost is going to destroy mostly all of the ingredients that are in the whatever you're putting in there. So, uh, and the microbes will do their magic. So I, I wouldn't worry about that if you're not putting you know, organic material and into your com only organic material. And so I'm not sure you know, how organic, because I, I sometimes buy organic apples and sometimes I don't, but they all go in, you know, the apple cores go into the- uh, So you don't worry about the well, yeah, I, I non-organic, yeah, exactly. the organic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I worry more about the pesticides, mosquito spraying, you know, all this other things that you see going on now. Uh, you know, spraying all this material around that, that to me is more dangerous than anything else than worrying about, you know, little bits of uh, uh, non-organic material going into your compost. 
Okay. Um, uh, so back to the um, purchasing the um, composter. Um, so my understanding is everyone who attended this meeting tonight is eligible to buy, can contact me and we can uh, distribute the composter, right? Yeah. Well, and you have any, any uh, homeowner, any, any body in Monmouth, that lives in Monmouth County, a homeowner or not, uh, can purchase these units. You know, it just not, it's not just because of this talk. Oh, okay. So the question is, I'm in. The question was, I'm in Morris County. Can I still purchase a composter from Monmouth County? Uh, they say you have to be in Monmouth, but I know people have <laughs> purchased them out of, and and they make a nice gift too. If you're looking for like a housewarming gift or something unusual, for thirty five dollars, it's great. You know, you, and you're doing something for the environment. Uh, you know, so. You know, if there's a housewarming party or somebody's birthday or something for $35, you know, it's a, it's a nice a, little thing. I, I want one. So everyone who wants to get one of these composters, go on to the um, CLU website, and Regina will tell you the address again at the end, and send us a message there, and then you send us a check for $35, and we'll gather it all together, and then we'll have a day that you come and pick them up. Um, mm -hmm. So you can contact us on the face, CELU Facebook page, CELU website, or you can contact me at karsyv356 at gmail.com. So three ways to get this thing, because we'd like to, the, the goal is to get them into everyone's houses, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's, that's the trick here. Okay, and so if, if you get, uh, if you get a number of these, uh, you know, folks interested, I, I'll come back out and show you some tricks of using the compost unit that I've learned over the years that really makes it uh, user friendly. Oh, that was great. I love that you have that, that metal thing on your, you explained how you have that metal thing by your sink and you carry it out and you put it in and you have my leaves there. It, very nice, yes, thank you. Um, and, those, and those compost units, I, mine is stainless steel. Like I said, I've, I've had it 20 years and it still you know looks great, but they have uh, porcelain decorative pieces that you can put out on the counter and people would just say, well, it's a very nice looking bucket there. What's it for? Oh, it's for my compost. You know. <laughs> but they have carbon filters and things in them. And uh, yeah, they they uh, they know that, you know, people are concerned about the look of it. And, uh, so companies are really making some beautiful uh, pottery that you can use. That's very cool. OK, so here's a question. Um, we have a lot of compostable food waste in the summer because of our organic farm CSA, but we didn't save any of our fall leaves. So when is the best brown material to combine with the food waste? Uh, well, sawdust, uh, wood chips. Um, you start talking about everything that has to be swole going in there. Uh, so- Everything has to be what? It's, it's always the problem with people who want to get composting plenty of green material you got plenty of kitchen waste the, the issue is getting the brown that's why i say if, you, if anybody has lawn service if you have a neighbor that shreds leaves just talk to them say here you know here's the bags just put them in the bags for me i'll you know bring the bags home or you if you have a lawn service you know they, to keep you happy they, i'm sure they'll do it uh, you know they'll put leaves their leaves in your bag shredded leaves so uh yeah, so there, there are ways of getting it, but that's the that's the tough part of the composting is getting the brown material. Uh, uh, there's a question. Uh, question: Can you use brown paper bags torn up? Yes, yeah, yes, but small. Everything's small again. Newspaper, but again, in moderation. If you put too much in there, it gets wet. It gets really hard to work with. It gets really stiff. Uh, newspaper, you'd be surprised. It gets wet and matty, and it just clogs the whole system. So everything in moderation, make it small, spread it. If you're gonna use brown paper bags, yeah, shred them and uh, just spread them out in, in the unit. And if you think they're starting to clog up, then you just stop using them and let the microbes you know, destroy what's there for now. Can you use the paper from your shredding machine? Uh, well, that's sort of glo a little glossy on there or some of them. Might be. Yeah, you don't wanna use any sure. of that, yeah. Oh, okay, so just brown paper bags. And, and the ink they're using, I'm not sure about the ink. I know okay. newspaper, they're using uh, um, uh, non-petroleum. 
So that, that ink would not harm the compost from the newspaper. But again, it has to be shredded and spread out uh, so it doesn't mat. Nice. Uh, what about adding worms? Worms are gonna be there. You're gonna be so surprised that uh, out of nowhere, you're gonna find there it's worms and all kinds of things gonna do their magic for you. Okay. I just did mine a week ago. There were so many worms in that I hand picked them to put them back in because I, I was making my finished compost and I don't want the worms in the finished compost. So I was picking them out and putting them back into the new compost that I was making. Wow, very impressive. Very impressive. This has been <laughs> so interesting. I can't believe it. Um, all right. Okay. Um, oh, all of a sudden I was going to be, okay, we run out of uh, questions, but we got a all of a sudden a bunch more came in. Okay. So we have rabbits that produce a lot of droppings that are absorbed in soy based pellets. Is that considered green or brown ingredient? Uh, manure would be a brown material. Manure, even if it's in a soy based pellet. Oh uh, yeah. It's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to work for you. Okay. And yeah. then, um, oh, how do you make your finished compost? Oh, uh, that's a good question. When I think I'm ready for it, when my compost unit, I use the earth machine, is about three quarters filled to the top. And this is why I say I'll, I'll come out and show folks some tricks that I use. I can actually uh, shake that unit back and forth and lift it. It's lightweight. And I lift it up and I put it to the left or the right of the pile. Now there's a big pile of composted material there. Now I take my wheelbarrow, I put a screen on there, and then I just take pitchforks full of the compost material, put it on the screen and just go cross, cross, across the screen. What falls through is my back into the compost. Oh, oh uh, Tom, we're mo losing you a little bit. Yes. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, what, yeah. Can you slide further over to the sides? All of a sudden, we you're, you you don't sound as good as you were sounding. Oh, OK. I don't know. I'm on there. top. I'll be. Uh, yeah, don't through. move from there. <laughs> <laughs> right there is good. Yeah, so uh, I have my wheelbarrow. I put a screen on top. And then I uh, put shovelfuls or pitchforks full of compost on there. And I just push my uh, little hand shovel back and forth across it. Whatever falls through the screen is the finished compost. What doesn't go through goes back into the compost unit. Oh. Yeah. You know, and I could demonstrate that again, you know, when, when if the folks want that, you know, if you get a group of people. Oh, that would be great. So when, when you send me an email, or a message that you're going to order the one of the $35 earth machines. Also, then say if you want to have another meeting. Um, I know I do. So um, we'll, we'll organize that. Um, all right, there is a question about um, if you're using a wire bin, how do you get to the bottom of it? Well, again, I, I think with the wire bin, you can use it the same way I do with my compost unit. Just uh, shake it back and forth, and you'll be able to lift it up and move it either side of what's there, and then you'll have it, everything exposed. Does that make sense? That's me. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. the questions. Um, okay, um, that was the last question. Okay, I, wonderful. This was just such a marvelous talk. I really uh, appreciate very much you coming and um, uh, talking to us and, I feel inspired. I am going to go compost. That's it. it. <laughs> well, well, thank you for inviting me, and thank you, you know, for you and your team. Uh, you've been great to work with you know, everybody there. So, well, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Regina's going to do. Regina Christian is our co-president, um, and she's going to do the closing. Okay. I want to thank you, Mr. Matulowitz. It was really interesting. I love the idea about putting the rabbit over the, the company. Oh, yeah. Really great. Makes you want to get a rabbit. <laughs> I want to thank everyone else for joining us. I hope you found it as informative as, as we did. This meeting was recorded. It will be made available on our YouTube channel. 
if anyone wasn't able to make it and wants to look at it, it will be up in a few days. You go to YouTube, you search CILU Homedale to find it. And that so is now I also um, tell where they can send the message for to get to buy the Earth Machine. The, when you give the Facebook the page, website. everybody get ready. The Facebook page and the uh, website address. Yeah, I'll give that later. Um, I just want to talk about some upcoming events. We have there will be a daffodil walk hosted by FOHOS, our sister organization, Friends of Home Dell Open Space. That will take place on Saturday, April 9th from 1 to 3 p.m. You meet a bayonet farm. It's a two and a half mile walk. You'll see hundreds of golden daffodils, some planted more than 60 years ago by the late Laura Harding. It really is a sight. It's beautiful. Then on Monday, April 11th, will be our annual CELU's annual meeting. It will be on Zoom. We ask all CELU members to come on promptly at 7.30 so you can vote for our new slate of candidates. I'm excited to say that we have four new people joining our board and you can meet them next month. At 7.45, we will open up the meeting to the public for a fascinating presentation by local historian, John Schneider. He will talk about the Bell Labs horn antenna which provided evidence that confirmed the Big Bang Theory on how the universe was created. For this discovery, scientist Robert Wilson, who some people here may know, and Arno Penzias won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1978. The Horn Antenna, which is located in Homedale, right off Homedale Road, was designated as a National Historic Landmark in 1989. On Saturday, April 30th, there will be a dedication also called called a wet down, I don't know why, of our new firehouse. That will take place from 12 noon to 4 p.m. There'll be, it's at 12 Corfitt's Corner Road. There will be music and food. And I know many CELU people were very involved in getting that, um, getting fire protection for the Southern part of Homedale. So you may be interested in going. On May 1st, after a two year hiatus, CELU will, CELU will once again sponsor our Earth Day Festival at Bayonet Farm. It will be our 22nd year. There'll be new shows and activities, so please everyone stop by. As always, the parking, the tours, and the shows are all free. Can't beat that deal. And then uh, that morning, the morning of May 1st, FOHOS will have the Earth Day Greenway Walk through the map reminiscence section of the Homedale Park. It's about a three mile walk. It begins at 10 and it arrives at Bayonet Farm around noon just in time for the festival. We have a lot going on. Also in May, we may host a township committee primary candidate forum if there is a contested primary. We won't know about that until the filing deadline in early April, so we'll give you information at the April 11th meeting. June, we are have plans in the works, but I can't discuss them yet. But ju in July, we are planning a wildlife watching sunset cruise around Sandy Hook Bay, and we'll give more information as we confirm the plans. So if you'd like more information about these events and also uh, to uh, tell us that you want the compost bin, you can visit us on Facebook under CILU for informed land use dash CILU, or you go to our website, wwwhomedale ciluorg Say that again. Say that again. Okay. The, on Facebook, you go to Citizens for Informed Land Use dash CILU, or you go to our website, www.homedale dash CILU.org. While you're on our website, we hope you will consider joining, becoming a member. Dues are only $20 per person, $40 for a family. So I just would like to, to, to finish by saying no matter where you live in Homedale, there's a good chance that the work of our CELU volunteers that we have been doing for the past 23 years to protect our watershed, preserve our natural resources, and advocate for an open and transparent government have had a, not, a positive impact on your quality of life in Homedale. We will continue to do this important work and hope you will consider joining us. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Matulowicz. It was very informative and interesting. And I bid everyone good night. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank Good you night. again. Thank you. It was wonderful. Really appreciate Bye -bye. you coming. Good night. Good night.